beautiful Sunday morning, July the 26th of 2020. As we uh, get ready to do our Sunday school class, I appreciate everyone that's on. Hopefully we'll get more signing in. The title of our lesson this week is We Are Joined Together. We are joined together. The passage, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 23, and chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, 19 through 22. Again, that's Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 23, and chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, and 19 through 22. We, we are reading from the Christian Standard Bible translation out of what we use uh, for the, the people in the young adult class. You may have a King James or a New King James or whatever other translation that you have. It should be fairly close. <laughs> in the Bible Meets Life section of my instructor book, it says human beings are social creatures. We were not designed to live in isolation. We desire to belong, whether it's belonging to a family, a group of friends, a social network, or a group with a shared interest. The church is a family, the body of Christ. Being a part of Christ's church is not an option. God's design for us to live and serve together as his body. Christ has joined us together. And I will apologize, I am fighting a little bit of a head cold this morning. <clears throat> but I made note of the first couple of sentences there. Human beings are social creatures. We were not designed to live in isolation. That part was covered. Now we're in Ephesians, but that part was covered way yonder back in the book of Genesis when Adam was created and the, the Trinity, but God and Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God said, it is not good for man to be alone. And then he did what? Well, then he created Eve, a female, to be the counterpart to the male so that we would, one, not be alone. We would have someone to spend our time with. And two, he designed us to have di different attributes. He designed us to have coinciding things that for what the male is lacking, the female can fulfill and, and vice versa. So it is not good for us to be alone. And I'll get to a point here in a moment when I say all of that about the male different attributes as we get into our lesson. Our setting, the Apostle Paul wrote to a church he knew well. He spent about three years in Ephesus on his missionary journeys. Since the name Ephesus does not appear in some early copies of this book, see Ephesians 1.1 is the key there, some scholars believe Paul wrote a letter to several churches in the area around Ephesus. And the book we have was preserved in Ephesus. Paul, as a church planter, wrote many letters to churches and church leaders. And if you'll remember that, he sent a lot of those from through Titus. Uh, he sent a lot of them through Timothy especially. But he did use runners and his assistants when he wrote letters, especially <clears throat> the prison epistles and the things he had to get out while he could not travel. He would send those with people to uh, either a particular church sometimes, or in this case, what is presumed to be multiple churches, the same letter. So whether those churches came together into one big thing, or if we'll use uh, Titus as in in his, his an example here, but or Titus went to church, you know, A, and shared the letter, then he went to church B and C on down the line. 
we don't know that, but the the way it reads, the way it writes, it is believed that he sent this to many churches. Then it mentions family. The church is a family, the body of Christ. I believe that. The, the fact that we are a family, that we should enjoy spending time together, that we should be helpmates to each other. You know, it's, uh, we lost uh, one of the stalwarts of our church this week, this past week, and, uh, you know, he'll be missed in our family. It'll be like somebody is definitely not there anymore. So it is a family, and we, we should grow accustomed to having those people around and missing them. All right, let's get into our, our scripture and our lesson. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. He exercised, I'm sorry, he exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. You know, Paul uh, used the concept of the, of the church being Christ's body. And, uh, and this analogy was used more than once in the Bible. <clears throat> but it is a good analogy. It is a good thing to, to allow us to be able to be able to comprehend what it is that, that Paul is talking about here. So one of the questions we'll get started off with to help kind of spur our, our thinking why is the body with Christ as the head an apt metaphor for the church? And you can, you can take your time and, and think about that and think about all the different parts and the different ways that that can mean. You know, it's, uh, as we move into it, you couldn't imagine your body functioning without the head. And we know people who do very well when they're missing uh, body parts and not just external that we can see body parts, but maybe internal body parts. But I'm sure that those people would like to be, I guess what we would call whole and, and be able to function as most everyone else. But they do do very well and they adapt to their environment. They adapt to the things that they need to do. And as we look at what Paul's trying to describe to us here, when we look at the very first line there, verse uh, 20, he exercised this power, of course, now, we, we got to go back before verse 20 to understand what the power, what all the power is. But in this case, what it's referring to is he exercised this power in Christ. So we're talking about God by raising Christ from the dead. And not only did he raise Christ from the dead, he brought him back to heaven in the throne room where God is and put him at his right hand. And that's where Jesus is today, and that's where Jesus has been for some 2,000 years. And, you know, we've got a lot of people, a lot of detractors now that are 
trying to change the way we we keep time. We we have basically before Christ and after death. Now that's not what those two letters mean, but that is what it is before Christ and after his death. So that's the way we keep time. That is a significant event in the history of our world that, that time is based upon that. And now, now people are coming in over the last several years and they're trying to change that. And, and now they have before current era and current era. Well, that's not the way it was. A significant event occurred and that was the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why it got its name and that's how we keep time. Nobody else can say that. Nobody else can say, well, we keep time based upon Gary. That's not the case. So that is a significant event that is an important person. He made an impact upon this world, and we keep time based upon him. <clears throat> and then we get into what the Jews to try to dispel some of the Jewish thinking in, a, in, a, in some of this. If you'll remember, as we read this next section here, this next part of the verses, uh, the Jews, what they were thinking. So in verse 21, in this translation, it says, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, every title given. So what was the important thing about that well the jews when they thought of the savior coming and this is part of the reason why they still are waiting why they still are are holding on i'm gonna move the camera just a smidge down here uh why they're they're keeping they're waiting for christ to come is because when they when they got the Christ, when, when that Savior, that Redeemer came, they were expecting him to be most likely a, you know, a large, gallant man, maybe, you know, muscled up and very strapping and very handsome, and he was going to have a lot of power, and he was going to be a new king or governor, that type of ruler, and he would be riding a big, powerful horse, and they had all of these things that when, when Christ came that they were expecting. Now, none of that was ever predicted to them as such, but that's what they had in their mind, and that was what was passed down, passed down, passed down, passed down through thousands of years. <clears throat> and so when Christ came, and it tells us Christ was a very average man, uh, and, and he was not really what they would consider a lot to look at. Maybe he wasn't very handsome. Maybe he wasn't very, uh, didn't have a lot of musculature and, and different things. And uh, maybe he didn't speak like they thought he should speak. And maybe he didn't ride the horse that they shot, thought he should ride and different things. And it was hard for them to believe and, and still is today that when Christ came, Jesus came that he was the man that was predicted all those years and all of those prophecies to come and be the redeemer of the world. But he was, and, and when God brought him to heaven and put him over by his right hand or at his right hand, it tells us Jesus is the stuff, okay? Jesus is it. Outside of God, the Father Jesus is it. He's over everything. He was there when the world was created. He was there during the, the initial part of man and the downfall of sin. And he was there when it was time for them to make the decision that Christ would come, that Christ would be a part of this world and that he would walk here. He would give the opportunity to be the sacrifice for one and for all. And, and then he would die. And see, that's the thing. Christ knew that he was going to have to die 
when he came here and he knew that he was not going to die in his perfect body, in his perfect form to where he would not feel any pain and he would not feel any hurt. He knew that he was going to be a man, a human being, and he knew that the pain and the distress he was going to have to go through. And he still came. He was died. He was re he he was died. Huh. Need to go back to school. He died and was resurrected on the third day. Spent some more time here on the earth because people saw him after that. Then he was drawn up to heaven, and that's where he's still at today, as I mentioned earlier. And he is over. Pharaoh, he is or, over Caesar, he is over all of those people back in those days that had the power, the kings and different things. And no one will ever have a name such as his ever again. All right. And as we get ready to move on into our next section, the author here of this particular section wrote in about verse 23, some readers might recall Paul's encounter with the risen Christ as Paul went to Damascus. Christ indicated that when Paul persecuted the church, so when he persecuted the church, he was persecuting the people, not a building, the people. He was in effect persecuting Christ himself. And that's that's our indicator right there that we are a part of Christ's body. We are a part of Christ. Christ is a part of us. And if one of us is persecuted, then the people who are persecuting us persecute us all. It's they're they're not separate. And then something that I've been trying to I've been passing along for a few weeks now was also brought up in this first section when the author wrote, many Christians, however, routinely think of the church as an institution or a building, and it's not. It is not a building. It's not a place. It's not necessarily the Baptist or the Methodist or the Pentecostal or the or Jews or whoever the you want to put in there. It's not those. The church is a group of people scattered out through this entire world that have trusted Christ as their savior and are looking for his return. That's the church. It's not just Antioch Baptist Church in which we're doing this. It's not Oakland Baptist Church here in Corinth or whatever other church you want to pick. It is an entire body of people scattered throughout this entire world, and they're all a part of us, and we are a part of them. All right, moving into our next section, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Verse 8 says, For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good work, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. A lot of good information in those few verses there, those three verses. The first thing we notice when we read that first part, it says, for you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from work so that no one can boast. Now, remember in James, he also tells us that, but we're not saved by the works we do. If that were the case, Christ would have never had to have came back because people were doing works. People were following the law. They were doing the works. They were trying to follow all the extra little things that the Pharisees had added over the years and different things, and they were doing that. So they were doing works. But that was not good enough. It is, uh, you know, in our world, it is very much to be expected, one, for people to put themselves first, two, for them to accept that 
they do no wrong, that the world should be supporting them and not them helping support the world. And we know this, and, and I'm gonna tell you that every one of us, everybody that's listening in today, everybody that'll watch this after the fact, and this includes myself, we all have a little bit of that. And we can't say that we do not. We all have at times an elevated sense of self-importance. And that's okay. You know, we should feel good about ourselves. We should take pride in ourselves and the things that we do and the way that we look. Th that's okay. It's not to say that we can't be happy with ourselves. What he's trying to tell us is, is when we start putting ourselves first instead of Christ first and the church first, we start running into problems. And if you haven't looked around uh, at the world today and even in this country about people putting themselves first and not their fellow man, then you haven't opened your eyes. There are a lot of bad things going on right now, especially in this country that we're not used to. And it, it's scary in a way. And in a way, it's very, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a happy time in the life of a Christian because we can see that the end is coming. And while there is some fear there, there's some, there's some doubt or maybe uncertainty in our heart about what's going to happen and how long we're going to be here and what will we have to endure before Christ comes. We don't know those things. But when we when we look out at this world and we read this Bible and the things that's in it, we know that they and it should be both a happy and sad time for us. Now back to the lesson I, I strayed there and I apologize. But we can't save ourselves through works it is god's gift and the the good thing about it is is all we have to do is ask it's there it's on that table sitting in front of us it's kind of like the you know the small child at their birthday party and there's their cake and what's the thing that they want to do they want to stick their finger in that icing and, and get that icing and eat that cake icing and you know, the mom's over there, you can't do that, don't do that. And, you know, the, all the child needs to do really is ask, and they would be given a part of that cake at that time. And that's the way it is with God. That gift is there. That gift is available. All we have to do is ask for it, and he'll give it to us freely. There, there's no catches. We just have to ask for it and accept it. <clears throat> and uh, when we look at some more of this here, I wrote a question down, one, uh, just a, something that I thought of, which is, what do you remember about the moment that you were saved? What do you remember about that? Um, I noted a thing over here in the author's uh, description and in his writing over here. And let me find where I underline it. Paul noted that Christians should be eager to do good works. Paul understood that from God's ex eternal perspective, our good deeds are a crucial part of being saved people. Um, and that's not exactly where I was headed. I'll find it in a moment, but once we're saved, once we have Christ in our heart again, and he's no longer standing outside our heart's door knocking, we should do good works. The good works before are not going to save us, and the good works even now are not going to save us. What saved us was when we accepted Christ into our life as our Savior. So some people use this to get out of doing works, to get out of doing good for people. And that's not the case. 
he tells us here, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So once we're saved, we should desire to do good works. We should desire, desire to do things to help our fellow man, to, to move forward Christ, to try to win more souls to, to him. Those works should be there. We should be able to look, you know, in, in one uh, description, they used it as the fruit of the tree. You know, we, we know a tree by the fruit that it bears. And we should be able to look at a Christian's self, at a Christian's works, and know that Christ is with them. And then the other thing is, it asks the question there, what do these verses teach us about God's grace? And the thing about God's grace is, again, it's free. It's all-encompassing. It's all forgiving. And we really don't have to do anything for it. We don't have to, to work toward it, as it tells us here in these scriptures. All right, moving into our last section as we start to wrap down our time. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. So then, so we made a transition here. Paul, he's good about making transitions, therefore, and so then, and those things. We made a transition. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. A lot of questions here that I actually noted that they asked that I will ask out loud for you to think upon. One is what are some benefits and responsibilities of being a member of God's household? Remember, while there is a great benefit, which is salvation, there are also responsibilities, as we talked a moment ago. Christ, one, gave us the responsibility to go out and spread the gospel. That was a commissioned responsibility for you and I to do. And there are other responsibilities as, as we think about the church and how it functions. Another question is, how has the church played a significant role in your life? And man, that's a big one. And for those of you who have, have listened to us as we've sang before and given testimony or, or in a, my Sunday school classes or on these, and I've mentioned it in these video sessions, boy, my church is huge part of my life. It, um, I truly mean it again when I say that the people there don't know what what they do for me and they don't know the way that I need them, the way that I need to see them. I mean, I see names that are listed over here in this side panel and I can, I can name off, you know, several things each one of them uh, have done for me and mean to me. But my church, man, they, they, they support me. They lift me up when, when I'm down, and, and they are important to me. And then another is, when have you experienced a sense of togetherness in your church? And wow, think about some of the services we've had over these last several years. And, and some of those services where, uh, you know, we've just sang. We've, Brother David has just felt the, the moving. And he's gotten up and said, you know what? We're just going to sing. We're going to do that song again. And, and you think about all the people that flooded the altar. And 
yes, yeah, some of them went down there and they prayed for themselves, but there were a lot of them that were praying for other people, other people in that church. But, but they were all there in that altar together. And, and while they may have been doing an individual thing, they were still in that group. And that group movement, that tug, whenever you saw those first people start going down and the way that it tugs at you and the way that it lifts you up, and it may have brought you down. Wow, it's, it's, it's a moving, moving experience. But back to our, our lesson, it starts off, so then, so a transition, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. Before our salvation, it's already used these analogies in, in a couple of lessons uh, prior to where we're at right now. But before you were a part of God's family again, that's the key, um, we were just wandering lost down here. It's like going to a, a foreign country by yourself, not speaking the language, not understanding the customs, and you're trying to find your way. And, and people, a lot of times, maybe that they're not gonna help you because you are a stranger. When we think about uh, the story of the Good Samaritan and all the people who walked by that gentleman that was in the, the roadside ditch there and left him laying, you know, a lot of times, you know, they're, they're afraid of you and, and they don't understand you and you don't understand them. And, and so you just choose to stay apart. But when we accept Christ in, as our savior and he starts to fill our hearts, we're no longer a foreigner or a stranger in Christ's kingdom. We are now a part of him. And that's what it told us a little earlier but we're a part of his household. So we get the same rights. Once, once we've accepted that, we look back and, and think, wow, what have I done? You had Moses, Abraham, Paul, who was the writer of this one, the, the apostles that Christ called, all of these people that did so much for the moving of the, of the church and here we are, we accepted Christ, and now we're drawn into this family with them and given the same rights as they have and, the, and all of the same blessings as, as they get. Is that not amazing to think about? And Christ himself has the cornerstone. Now he's moved from talking about specifically the church not being a building to using this metaphor of a building, of the cornerstone. So Christ is our cornerstone and we can lean upon him. He will hold us up and he will be our support and our strength in times of need because that's what the cornerstone does. And it tells us in him, the whole building being put together goes into a holy temple in the Lord. And so we keep building, we keep adding people we keep adding souls, we keep adding Christians, and we continue to build this temple, we continue to make it stronger. And one day, we will be blessed before that, or because of that. And think about our little church, and the more we get to add to it, and the, the more people that we add, and, and the, those people give, and the outreach that we're able to do uh, with our community and with the people in our church, the, the help that we're able to give them. It's all part about being a part of Christ in God's church. The last section, we're down to just our last couple of minutes here, uh, is the live it out section. It says, how will you embrace your role as a member of Christ's church? Consider the following applications. Confess wrong thinking. In order to adopt a right mindset of your part in Christ's church, 
confess any wrong mindsets or attitudes you hold or have previously held about individuals in your local church. Submit to Christ. Reread Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 23, and reflect on the power and authority of Jesus Christ. Submit your life to his authority and control. Commit or recommit to a church. If you're not a member of a local church, pursue membership to begin experiencing the beauty of living together in the household of God. This might mean going through a membership class or talking to a pastor. If you're already a member, commit yourself anew to the covenant and mission of your church. And, you know, I, we think about a lot of times 80% of the work of the church is done by 20% of the people. And that's just a good analogy, even in, in business in general. But I ask you to think about what you're doing for your church and for your community. And what could you be doing? That'd be the next question. What could you be doing that would help win souls to Christ, which is the ultimate goal? It says, our experiences with church in the past can, can affect our approach to church today, but God's grace can help us embrace a healthy view of our role in Christ's church, make a conscious decision to commit to God's view of his church. Some people did not have good church experiences or have not had good church experiences. Some churches, and, and even ours probably uh, does at times, maybe individuals, but there are churches out there, and I'll use church maybe loosely in this term, that are self-serving churches, self-supporting churches, and they're, ru they're ruled in a more tyrannical nature versus using God as the head and him as guidance and then us working under him. And maybe they misinterpret or misuse the, the scripture. The, a big one would be sparing the rod. You know, some people take that to mean that you should, you know, beat your children or beat your wife. So there, there are, and, and that's not what it means, but there are, churches that are that way and there are people who have had bad church experiences and it makes it very tough for them to be in it. I've got to wrap up. The same thing with a relationship. Once you've been in a relationship that was really bad, it's hard to get into another fully trusting relationship. So we have to be that light. We have to be that church in our community to be that light, to be that church to where people can come. And I'm not just talking about Antioch. I'm talking about your church to be that one where people can come to and feel welcome. All right. I appreciate you. I